Okay, we're being right. recorded. Very good, very good. Christina, if you're ready, I think we're about ready to begin. Let All me right. give me one moment. Let me just make sure my PowerPoint is <laughs> cute. I up. made you a co-host, so you should be able to screen share. Excellent. Just one moment. We should do this before we're in front of an audience, right? <laughs> oh, well, no, it never happens that way. <laughs> okay, let me try one more time. Uh, well, there we're screen sharing. Let me pull my PowerPoint up. Yeah, you're a co-host. Never had to make someone a host. Right. Here we go. So, no so this yeah, there you go. Beginning. Okay, excellent. So let me stop sharing and we'll be good to go. Okay. All right, then. We welcome Professor Christina Hook for the first time to the Holocaust and Genocide Lecture Series. She will speak to us this evening of the Ukrainian Holodomor and the war with Russia that plagues Ukraine today. Professor Hook is an assistant professor Professor of Conflict Management at Kennesaw State University. She is an anthropologist and scholar practitioner specializing in genocide and mass atrocity prevention, as well as post-conflict reconstruction and war-related environmental degradation. Her most recent work, I think, is the Ukrainian Holodomor and Comparative Genocide Perspective, forthcoming in underrepresented cases of genocide in global modern history. Dr. Crook's current study is the product of over two and a half years of field work in Ukraine and previously unpublished interviews with over a hundred Ukrainian political leaders and activists, journalists, and academics. We look forward to hearing your insight on the Ukraine and welcome to the lecture series, Christina. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here and to get to participate in such a well-established, impactful lecture series. It's truly my honor. Um, I'm just going to pull up a quick presentation. Here we go. All right, I believe everyone can see my now. Um, I think we learned by both listening and by looking. I've gathered some photos from my time in Ukraine to for our time to. So yes, as the kind introduction alluded to, I will be speaking on the Ukrainian Holodomor, which is an event that happened in the 1930s. I'll share more about it for those who don't know. And also looking at the impact of the Holodomor and the stories around the Holodomor and how they're shaping what Ukrainians are currently enduring with Russia's full-scale invasion. You know, I wanted to start off with this tweet that I saw online. It really summarizes this link for people between the past and the present, as well as how different scholars uh, answer this question. You know, a lot of us are being asked by the public or by journalists, and what are the origins of what we saw happen last year? So, you know, we know that this is a continuation last year of a war that began in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and sparked armed conflict in eastern Ukraine. But maybe, you know, some pundits will go back to war. Some political scientists may say, you need to go back to the fall of the Soviet Union. And maybe for historians who've also shaped my career, they say, well, back in the ninth century, this and this happened. So that theme of history and its connection to the present both shapes my work and my talk tonight. I wanted to, I had such a kind introduction that maybe this isn't necessary, but I wanted to explain a little bit about what I do in Ukraine as a genocide scholar. Um, I, I went to Ukraine for the first time in 2015 when I began my work there. And, um, you know, the what's going on currently, I've also written about my view that, that what's currently happening in Ukraine is a genocide. I'll talk about that. But when I went to Ukraine in 2015, I, I really thought that my work would be more focused on past genocide, on, on stories that we tell around such large scale violent events. And I wanted to talk to people who um, use genocide in their professional career in different ways. So legal actors work to establish judicial courtroom burdens of proof. Academics, we look at it slightly different. We, we look at, you know, as best we can tell, the nuanced dynamics of the situation. It's a little bit, I always say, you know, we know that lawyers were able to establish that the notorious American gangster Al Capone was a tax fraud, but we academics might also add to the conversation that he did quite a lot more than that. Um, I also wanted to talk with Civil who does lots around genocide education, genocide 
participants. Perhaps we have people from those communities on the on with us today. Um, and also politicians who work with this question of, of political commemoration. This was my research plan. Um, I've, I've done interviewing across 32 different locations. I feel very lucky that my interviewing and my work has been all across Ukraine, all across its geographic diversity, its political diversity. Um, and I've gotten to speak with a lot of very interesting people who have um, become well known over the past year. Um, I, I wanted to mention some of the types of places where I do my work. I observe academics and their conferences and lectures. I attend internal meetings with Ukrainian politicians. I go to activist trainings or congressional debates, diplomatic events, museum galas, anywhere where people were talking about the history of the Holodomor and the stories they wanted to tell. I wanted to listen to those. Now, I also, when I was in Ukraine, I also worked with Holocaust and Holocaust memory. So like many genocide scholars, I trained first in understanding the Holocaust, and I wrote my first master's thesis on the Holocaust. And so while I was in Ukraine, it was very important for me to also ask memory questions about the Holocaust, about what happened there. Um, I just put up my recent article, my recent book chapter on this topic there, and I, I put up two pictures from Ukraine. This is the Baba Yar Memorial as well. Both pictures are from the memorial complex. The top one is dedicated to children's victims there. So the Holocaust and its role in Ukrainian history is very important. And I'll just move a little bit briefly through it because I'm speaking on the Holodomor tonight, but I wanted to mention that as well. Now, the Holodomor, I actually wanted to pick this case um, a little influenced by my one of my early professors in my genocide studies career more than 15 years ago. His family is Jewish and they fled persecution um, in Ukraine during the Holocaust. And so I knew about famines, but I didn't know that much. And at that time in 2015, it was really helpful and important for me not to know that much about a case I wanted to study. I, I wanted to approach it with looking at some ideas I had around genocide modeling, genocide, um, the way that it unfolds, if something should be diagnosed as genocide, not for trying to adjudicate between this suffering is worse than this suffering, but really more trying to diagnose violence. But in order to do that, I, I wanted to pick a case that I didn't know that much about where my finger wouldn't be on the scale, so to speak. And for me, that was the Ukrainian Holodomor. That word comes from two Ukrainian words that mean both holod, which means hunger, um, and more. So the maybe the best translation kind of active verb is killing by hunger. And it's a, a, a famine that occurred in the context of larger Soviet famines, but it's been looked at as a potentially genocidal famine for a couple of different reasons. Um, so it killed many, many people. There are demographers who spend their entire careers looking at the numbers who died. I just put up the numbers by some recent demographic studies. And it also occurred in a very short time period. When I talk about the Holodomor, I'm personally talking about events that happened in less than two years. Four and a half million people were killed. And we know that such a thing is, is a deep moral wrong. It's a deep moral injury if this was intentional. But we also know for many of us who come to genocide that, that numbers don't really influence if, if something's a genocide or not. We're looking for patterns of violence. And so, you know, it was helpful to kind of understand, to go to the museum, I have that picture on the right, and to look at the records and to try to understand what had happened. Was there a drought? Was there a conflict? And you know, now we actually have a lot of records that have been declassified. And we even have records that were published in the 1990s from Russian archives. Russian archives are no longer open. Um, and not just last year, they were closed much earlier, but a lot of the records in Russia were also published in the 90s. So we're able to put together a fuller picture of what happened. And so what really set apart the case of the Holodomor was this combination of factors. So there were things like a deadly combination of grain requisitions that was less, that was less um, distinctive. Unfortunately, that was happening in many places, but there were also these unworkable grain quotas, things that were just impossible to deny. But what really 
began more significant in this case was Soviet authorities who would come and not just steal people's food, what they needed to provide for their family, but also to, to take their seeds and to destroy their farm equipment. And I would speak with many people and look at records. If the Soviet authorities couldn't take away um, food products, they would destroy it. There's witness testimony from a child who, you know, I apologize for, for uh, just telling a hard story, but he mentioned that the Soviet soldiers came, there was a large cabbage, they couldn't carry it, and they took turns urinating in it just to prevent the family from, from being able to eat that food. And so it wasn't just about sort of, you know, we want a cut of your agricultural good. It was really this, this intentional famine. There were also records where the Soviets were very detailed, like we know other perpetrators, I think of how detailed the Nazis were. Um, they kept very detailed records. And during the Holodomor, they kept very detailed records of how many fleeing peasants to catch at train stations. And so they would count how many people they caught trying to keep from starving to death. They would seize them at train stations, count them, and then put them back in their villages where they would seal it um, with something that translates in English into a blackboard regime. And soldiers would guard those villages, not allow people to leave. They would starve to death, trapped in those villages. And then within less than a year, the Soviet authorities would transport ethnic Russian people, ethnic Belarusian people into these areas and provide those people with many goods in many places. And so, you know, when you look at the archives and you look at the amount of research that we have today, you can really see um, this intent to destroy and whole or in part. You can really see these dynamics. So Moving on, I just wanted to mention, um, I wanted to mention a little bit about the Holodomor's legacy um, for Ukraine and, and also for Russia. Um, I've been asked to talk about both the Holodomor as well as what's going on. So I'll sort of begin my transition from what happened to its legacy. And I like to include this poster that was created by a Fulbright scholar who was based at the of Notre Dame, where I did my PhD. And she points out that about this number that the stadium picture represents were Every three days in the late spring of 1933, historians like Serhii Plohi at Harvard have estimated that the Holodomor killed uh, every one in, in eight people, so it had a significant effect. What was um, even more significant is just what I call, you know, it's a fancy academic word, but what I call cosmological destruction. And what I'm trying to get at there is a genocide, whether it's Holodomor, whether it's Holocaust, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's the former Yugoslavia. These are events that, yes, take people's lives. They can ruin their health for many years, even for people who survive, have terrible health impacts. But it also collapsed what we think of as their social world. And this is the pain and the horror of genocide. It, it's all of these unspoken assumptions, the sort of social norms that we have, the ways of our behavior that we know make us polite in our society, the ways of artistic expression or education, all of these ideas that we have. Genocides can often just collapse that. And that's what happened in the whole world of war in such a very short amount of time. Some aspects of cultural heritage were lost forever, although um, the Ukrainian national group would survive. And so this had a real impact. And this is where I'm really beginning to transition our conversation into what's going on now. Um, this is what my research in Ukraine showed when I talked with people. So you had the Holodomor happen, which of course targeted, um, you know, or it, it, it impacted ethnic Ukrainians, but it also impacted Ukraine's Jewish minority living there at the time. There are also stories that break my heart and that inspire me of mutual rescue between ethnic Ukrainian communities and Jewish communities. I know of one colleague who shared, who works on, on Ukraine's historic Jewish minority, and she shared a story where um, a Jewish family had access to food during the Holodomor and was able to um, save a family's seed grains and that helped them survive. And 10 years later, that same Ukrainian family was able to pretend that that Jewish family were their ethnic Ukrainian relatives because they were targeted less by the Nazis. So, um, you know, the, the, the Holodomor was something that was, was targeting many people who lived in these areas. But it had a devastating impact. It had a devastating impact on what we can think of as the Ukrainian social world at the time. And what is also so um, distinct, at least for me and the type of places that I've worked, is how long the Holodomor could not be discussed. 
Um, Stalin and, and that time in the Soviet Union is best described as totalitarianism. There was a slight lessening over time into maybe authoritarianism, but there were these terrible laws such as the 1934 treason law. And that law in summary basically said, if you do something um, that we think is subversive, we being the Soviet government, we will not only punish you, but we'll punish your entire your family, even if your family had no knowledge of your subversive act. And so that really, really dampened people's ability to talk about forbidden topics. And the Holodomor was one of those forbidden topics. It was never allowed to be discussed, even during the final days of the Soviet Union, when other aspects of Soviet totalitarianism were, were kind of allowed to be talked about. The word food, food shortage and famine were outlawed um, until the late 1980s, and Holodomor as a topic, as an intentional famine, was not talked about at all. And what that actually created within families was um, the situation where if a family had maybe lost all of their children, they might later um, survive, and sometimes they would have a child born later and that child born later wouldn't know that they had had seven other brothers and sisters, things like that. And, you know, I really just can't imagine like this, this level of suppression for 60 years, really, from 1933 until Ukrainian independence in 1991. Um, I really can't imagine that even the, the, the moral injury of losing your loved ones, as well as that compounding aspect where you now have to pretend that they never existed. Because if you talk about them or how they died, you might open up your, the rest of your family or your community for further persecution or death. And what happened during the Soviet Union was this process of um, really the Soviet Union working to kind of control different ethnicities. We probably know many people in the audience that, that the that Jewish population in the Soviet Union were treated terribly. Um, also, many other ethnic minorities were, were not treated great. And what happened in the Ukrainian context is um, Ukrainian identity was treated by the Soviet Union as something that could be controlled. So I would speak with, for example, um, a woman who was the daughter of ethnic Russian Soviet general, and she grew up living in what is today Ukrainian Kyiv. And so she had quite a lot of leeway. She had a lot of power as the daughter of the general. And so she made a career as a really famous DJ. And so she would say that, you know, I could have, um, I could have somebody play a Ukrainian folk song as long as it was one of the ones that was deemed safe. But one time I allowed them to sing the wrong folk song that we were all supposed to pretend didn't exist, um, that was supposed to be stamped out, and I got in trouble for it. And so it was treating, you know, identity as not something that was decided by people who felt themselves Ukrainian, but it was something that was controlled. It was created as kind of a token, token identity. Um, and that created this national identity vacuum that, that because of so much loss, because of these suppressions, because of trying to tokenize Ukrainian identity, there were these national identity vacuums. And that's where my work, you know, began to explore the role of Holodomor narratives. Um, and, you know, for, for there were some people who would use it for camouflage and I'm starting from the bottom up. So maybe some leaders felt that Ukraine needed a national story and Holodomor brought together more of the people in the East and the central part who were targeted with the West who tended to commemorate it more or, you know, any type of story, like any type of important historical event can be politicized. And so, you know, perhaps you'd failed your constituents, but if you just tried to talk about a, you know, an important issue, you might try to get away with it. Or there were some people who would try to do maybe unhealthy things like victim competition. I've mentioned the Holocaust and being a key one. But there were other things going on. I really saw during my time in Ukraine, I'm going to talk about the Euromaidan events um, and Russia's initial invasion. But what's really been happening in Ukraine due to having nine years of war with Russia is a transformation of the country into a political nation where people from really different backgrounds um, can, can coexist and, and actually lead society together. And what I began to see in these Holodomor narratives were they were capturing social cues and they were capturing these influential people's ideas from all of these different fields, people who were very different, who tended to disagree with each other about lots of things. 
they would all agree that Moscow of the past in the 1930s had tried to destroy Ukraine. And now Moscow of the 2014, 2015, 16, 17 is trying to do the same thing. They're not just waging these limited wars in our Eastern region or in our Southern Crimean province, but they're really doing something deeper. And this led to this kind of reclamation process of Ukrainian identity and pride, not tied to ethnicity, but more tied to heritage. Um, and so, you know, I think I'll skip over this slide. I've talked enough about it, but I really wanted to talk a little bit about identity um, because identity is central to what's going on. Um, it was something that was suppressed during the Soviet Union after Holodomor, and it's really central, I think, to understanding the current war. So these are a few of the questions that I felt were most important to be answered as we were trying to make sense of the just terrible, terrible suffering and chaos and war crimes and other things that we've observed over the last year. Understanding why, why Putin began this war back in 2014 and why he chose to escalate, central question. But it's not just Putin. You know, that's a, it's a narrative that, you know, I, I wish it were true, right? That if it was Putin's war, then we could focus all of our efforts on one person. But unfortunately, you know, one of the the, the big, very painful stories that's happening right now in Ukraine are videos circulating of, of Russians uh, apparently beheading in very graphic ways Ukrainian POWs. There have been you know, lots of instances of children being targeted for killing, rape, violence. And that's not happening actually by Putin himself. It's happening by, by Russian soldiers and by other occupational authorities there. And so understanding that role of social participation, what's going on there, how do Russians see Ukrainian, how the Ukrainians see themselves. Um, I've talked about, you know, this kind of way that Holodomor and tokenizing identity was tightly controlled during the Soviet Union. And so it's led to certain dynamics that, that happened in Ukraine. And that leads to a key question. What does it mean to a national group? What makes up national identity? And then why does that matter so much in this case? Uh, it matters a lot for understanding what's happening today. So I'd like to talk about this question of national group, national identity. So um, with your permission, I thought I might just show a short clip um, because it gets at a theme that I'd like to develop further. I think, you know, I think it losing to history, just how much of a shock uh, Ukrainian resistance to Russia was for many parts of the world. And so um, this works. I let me know if we have any issues and we need to abandon media, but um, I have this queued up and, and let me know if you can hear the sound and if, if it seems to be working for our audience for you to hear this. Can you hear this? Yes, it's a little breaking up a little bit, but it's coming through. Okay, great. Well, I'll play this just for a minute or two and then I'll, I'll tell you the point I'm trying to make with it. Just hours ago, Russian forces began their attack. You might soon fall to Russian forces. The Russians will take control of Kiev. Within 24 hours. The Russian force is so much larger than the Ukrainian one. It's not a question of if Russia takes the capital, it's a question of when. <laughs> Can the Ukrainian people stand up? This is day six. On the tenth day. Day twenty-two. Day thirty-three. Kiev is still standing strong. Okay, so I think that that, you know, that there's a point I'm trying to make with this. Uh, let's make sure. So can you see my PowerPoint? We're back. Technology is working. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so there's a point I'm trying to make with this. I think, you know, that, that it's easy to to now sort of understand that Ukraine has bogged down the what's presumed to be the world's second strongest army. But it's really important to remember that that's not how many people in the world felt. 
And, you know, I think in many ways, Ukrainians surprised themselves. I'm going to develop that idea in just a minute. But I show that video because it's this compilation of basically people outside of being of Ukraine being surprised at how many days they're holding out. One day, three days, 10 days, and now we're actually in the 400 days. Um, and so what's going on there? What does this have to do with this question I'm talking about with the world and more, with the suppression of identity, with the reclamation of identity? So I'd like to, to talk a little bit about what I might call Russians surprising themselves and Ukrainians surprising themselves. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, the sort of surprise for, for Russia was how um, ineffective. I would say that due to things like the Chechen Wars or Georgia, perhaps Russians weren't surprised at how brutal their army was, but how ineffective it was, was I think a bit more of a shock. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Corruption, um, the way that power is centralized in very few hands. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit too about why maybe Ukrainians surprise themselves and what this has to do with belonging to a national group and the transformation of Ukraine. And so the picture that I have here is a Ukrainian man who jumped on a tank as it was rolling down Kyrgyzstan, which fell to Russia pretty quickly in the beginning and was liberated last fall. And I want to point out a map that's often used for a stereotype. Um, and I'd like to talk through that a little bit. This is a 2010 map. This analogy doesn't work at all for the current president, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, Ukraine's first Jewish president. I have to say, as someone who conducted my participant observation with um, him as a candidate and as a, as a presidential, uh, as a president, um, it was very, very interesting for me at the time to, to have the first period of, of his inauguration where he was uh, Ukraine's Jewish president and where um, Prime Minister Grossman was also Jewish Ukrainian. And so besides the state of Israel, they were the only country in the world to ever have both a Jewish president and prime minister serving together. Um, so that map for Zelensky does not hold up to this analogy because he won in the landslide election. The map looks very different. But if you look at the 2010 election, the colors here summarize stereotypes that people sometimes have about Ukraine. Um, I also think about what these maps might look like in America. So, you know, I, I want to be very careful about stereotypes. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, identity and what these things mean. Um, so in some ways, some of these colors can divide um, areas where Holodomor happened. Um, so if you look at the red in the east, um, blue where Kiev is marked, um, spelled in the Russian spelling, but if you look, that's also as heavily affected by Holodomor. But those parts are places where the Russian language is, is often spoken. And um, that has to do for many reasons. Um, the Russian was the prestige language of the Soviet Union, but it also has to do with um, people during Holodomor times. I told you ethnic Russians were transported forcibly into Ukraine, um, but that doesn't really hold up to national identity. The man who jumped on a tank from Kyrgyzstan, I'm not sure if you can see my map, but he's from the southern part of Ukraine, the part that's colored deep red, um, places where, you know, when I listen to videos from Kyrgyzstan, they're usually in Russian language, um, but that doesn't have mean, you know, a sort of desire for the Russian state to rule over you. But I think in some ways, this process for many Ukrainians over the last year has been um, this process of, of discovering that, that these differences don't hold up when the nation is under threat together. Now, Ukraine has had a lot of um, a lot of what we might call turmoil. And in my larger work that um, maybe I'll just mention briefly, what I actually look at are these three periods and a, a series of crises that were happening. And I look at how the story of Holodomor was told during each of these periods. So when you look at yellow, this was the early years of Ukrainian independence. Um, the Holodomor became an open subject, but there was also the worst inflation since 1930s Germany. And you have things going on next door. You have the first Chechen war, which was quite brutal, and it was before Vladimir Putin um, was in office, and you have him elected president, and then the second Chechen war. So there's, there's some issues going on next door. Um, what you really look at with Holodomor stories is they're capturing, they're capturing when they're told in the 90s, this feeling of kind of amorphous 
suffering because you your sort of world has fallen apart again. Like the Soviet Union is no more. You've got to figure something else out. Many most Ukrainians, the vast majority, voted for independence, but it's still quite a big change, a political shock. Um, there's money money issues, and so Holodomor is capturing these ideas the way it was told. It wasn't about who did it exactly. It was just about the fact that life is filled with terrible suffering, and it was capturing kind of a social mood at the time. Then things really begin to change in Ukraine. There begin to be this more pronounced conversations. Um, dark topics like Holodomor became legal in the 90s, but they took some time for people to feel that they might want to talk about them. So during this time, President Yushchenko, I have him mentioned on this map because he was mysteriously poisoned. He was a sort of um democratically oriented presidential candidate who um, at first the election was falsified, the people took to the street and he was in office. He did a lot with historical memory. And I spoke with him. I had a three hour interview with him and I was asking him these questions about Holodomor, about his family stories, about why he decided historical memory was something that a president you know, should be involved with. And he told me the story of traveling uh, to the eastern part of Ukraine and finding these older, very, very elderly grandmothers who had survived Holodomor. And he gave a speech on its remembrance and they came up to him at the end and, and told that they were survivors. And he said, that's wonderful. Like I have my secretaries here. We would be so honored that if you would record your testimonies, thank you so much for coming. We would love to record your stories. And they told him, no, 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 Mr. President, you are in office today, and you say that this is a topic we can talk about, but who knows what could happen tomorrow. And this was reflecting people's deep in the Soviet Union. And um, later, um, a figure who was a bit notorious in Ukrainian politics did take office in 2010, President Yanukovych, who is now um, responsible for many of the state-initiated violence that happened in 2013 and 14. Um, and so, you know, there was something to what they were saying. So during this orange period, um, there were real debates about Holodomor. You can see that Holodomor is taking on these social issues about, about who Ukrainians had been, who Ukrainians were, and who Ukrainians should become. This was an open debate for many people in society, and they were expressing that through Holodomor. Holodomor was either um, something they had been victims of and resistors and survivors from the Soviet Union, and it was it was separate, or um, the, the Russian comfortable narrative was this was a tragedy of all Soviet peoples, um, which the records don't really indicate, but that narrative Okay, you know, we should lean in closer together. Um, so that was very much debated, and, and Holodomor stories were capturing those identity debates. And then, um, you know, there was the Euronegon revolution. I'm going to come back to that. Um, then right after that, within days, Russia annexes Crimea and begins armed conflict. Um, and that is when, you know, Holodomor really began to capture people wanting to say that, that we really feel this existential threat from Moscow. It killed so many of our family members and our, um, back in the 1930s, this could surely happen again. Um, and so that's what's really going on. And so I have this, this tweet, it kind of captures, you know, that there were internal struggles within Ukraine during these periods too. Um, this is a Ukrainian journalist. His story is very well known for people. He was beheaded um, and, and Ukrainians blamed um, the domestic political authorities. And so that was back in the year 2000. So when the Euromaidan events happen, um, they're called the Revolution of Dignity by many Ukrainians. And, you know, it was, it was a very interesting time. I, I first started going to Ukraine shortly after this happened. And it really ushered in, I think, um, a sort of broadening of, of what it meant to be Ukrainian. Um, it was really when I think many people began to put their foot down and say, we have sacrificed so much for freedom. And I see that rippling out today. Um, but the president in office, Yanukovych, he passed a lot of things that were called the treason laws or very harsh laws. Um, he was trying to cling to power after he had told his constituents that he would sign an economic agreement that would lead to greater integration with the European Union. That was reflective of a lot of people in society feeling that they wanted to lean more towards um, and you could tell the role that Russia had on pressuring Ukraine um, when suddenly he, he changed his mind and, um, and tried desperately to stay in power by 
um, violently dispersing what started out as student protests against this. And after the students were targeted, a lot of their parents and their relatives entered the streets. Um, and these became very, very, very big protests. Um, I spoke with one, with one person who joined them right away. And they said, why did you join? And he said, well, I'm a pediatrician and they beat the students right away. And I said, kids are being hurt. Like I have to go. This is not acceptable for how our society must behave. And so people had these very personal reasons for, for saying that state, state violence was not okay. And the situation kind of escalated through November all the way through January and February when um, and Ukraine refers to a group of, of citizens who were killed as the heavenly hundred of, of more than 100 people who were killed by state initiated violence. Um, and so during that time, this building that says freedom is our religion in, in Ukrainian on one side and English on the other, that was covering over the fact that, that that had been used as a supply area and kind of a medical facility for injured protesters. And it was set on fire and it took many years um, for it to be fixed. And so for many years living in Kyiv, like this was my view that I saw. Um, and then I also wanted to point out, I use this picture on the left because part of the treason laws were, for example, saying that the riot police with all of their gear could be in the streets against you. The protesters were not allowed to have any kind of protective gear, um, that they were just supposed to be, you know, sort of uh, nothing protecting them. And so people would protest that by putting ridiculous things on their head as helmets to say this is an unjust law. And so this man has a colander on his head. Um, and so in the end, um, when President Yannick party, the party of regions, he had a congressional block. Um, when many people began to be shot in the street, many of the congressmen associated with his party defected from that party. It was very politically toxic, and the parliament officially um, uh, removes him from office and calls for snap elections in three months. He fled first, it seems, to Kharkiv, and then he crossed the border. Um, and he is in Russia to this day. So that's what happened there. And I began to talk with people. One of the people I spoke with is a scholar. He's from the he's from Donetsk, which is one of the areas that's been impacted by Russia's armed conflict from the beginning. And he's a scholar there, very well known. Um, and he began to he stayed when when violence broke out because he had a, an adult son, so sort of a bigger man who was disabled and who would have needed a special wheelchair to evacuate. And he wouldn't leave his son. And eventually um, he was captured by these um, Russian backed proxy forces and he was held in captivity for nearly two years. And horrific treatment, he was tortured. And I would ask him these questions about historical memory. This is what he said, you know, talking to the people with weapons, I asked, why did they do that? What do you know about Ukraine? Why are you here? Um, and I'll, I'll point out that this interview was in 2019. Um, and so he said, why are you here? The Holodomor? Come on. I asked them who their linen was, Vladimir Lenin. And one of the people torturing him said, oh, a poet. And the other guy says, no, he was a military commander. So even all of these contestations about statues of linen and, and people don't even know who it is. It's, it's, it's using history to talk about something deeper. And then he, you know, as a person who grew up speaking Russian himself and Russian native speaker, he began to talk to me about the different word etymologies. This was important to him. And he was explaining how the word um, that means dignity in Ukrainian is, is very different for him, the first word I have on the screen, than the second word, the Russian variant. And so he said, dignity is in the Ukrainian translation is about the rising of your personality, understanding your worthiness and your mission in the world. And this process is the beginning of returning to our national memory. So this idea of dignity connected with memory, with reclaiming identity, was something that really came out in my conversations with him. And so I'll, I'll just briefly go through this, but I really wanted to show you a few of the pictures that I took it. Um, you know, I, I mentioned linen, this bottom picture, it's painted like kiss. This is one of the linen statues. People would take them down and kind of have fun like painting them in, in different colors. Um, the, the top picture is one of Ukraine, very well known. Um, you might think of him as a founding father. He's a poet and artist, um, um, Taras Shevchenko, but also there are, when I took this picture, they were practicing for the Independence Day Parade. There were fighter pilots going over. And so this kind of protecting your identity using military force was kind of captured in this picture I took on a walk in the park. And then I also wanted to mention this picture of children's art. I took this picture in 2019. And I have to tell you, it was really gutting watching last year. So many more trains carrying and fleeing from just the 
Diane, I am uh, hearing nothing. I got you. Katrina, uh, Christina, can you hear us? Well, she's going off. Well, let, let's give her uh, a minute to, yeah. to see. Um, I will message her. Okay. Hey, very good. Because the connection has been sketchy since she started. Yeah. Stop sharing. Why don't Diane, why don't you take it off share? That's maybe one way to so stop sharing. There we go. Okay, now she's disappeared. Let's see if she calls back in. Sorry, everyone. This is like the early days of COVID trying to figure out the technology. Um, this is on her end. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, she should be able to see now she's dropped off. Um, there she is. Good. Hi, Christina, you froze up. Did I? I, I didn't know how to alert you other than to... Uh, <laughs> That does happen. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Shall we try again? Maybe you can tell yes, me. Yes, carry on. Uh, what's the last thing you heard? Uh, so you were talking about the uh, the Stoinstva. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so I'll just skip ahead. I, did I cover this slide? Oh yeah, yeah. You were on that that slide. That's right. Okay. So I, I was on this slide. Thanks for your patience, to you and, and the audience. Um, you know, I have to tell you, I was sanctioned by the Kremlin last year as a genocide scholar, so we always make jokes in my circles that this is the result, bad internet when I talk about these topics. Um, but anyway, so I was talking about this topic, I was talking, I think, a little bit about um, maybe the picture, the child's picture, if you heard me say it before, um, the, the train that was carrying people to safety. I took this picture in 2019, so these dynamics that we saw in larger scale last year have been happening in Ukraine for some time. I think I also mentioned the picture of Lenin, just in case anyone didn't hear me, it's an excuse to show this picture again. This is what people do with uh, one of the statues of Lenin. They have their fun painting him. And of course, um, the, the top picture is a person who you can think of as Ukraine's founding father. He's a poet, um, but he represents for many people Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian language. And I snapped this picture in the park when the military pilots were practicing for Independence Day, but this idea of national identity and kind of being protected when it's under military threat for nine years kind of summarized in that nightly walk picture. Um, so moving ahead, I wanted to share with you one of the interviews that I did pretty early on in my time in Ukraine. This is a curator at the National Holodomor Genocide Museum in Kiev. Um, and just stunned when I look at what she told me now um, so many years ago, so many years before the large-scale escalation. And so she said, I'm a child of independent Ukraine, born after the fall of the Soviet Union, and Yanukovych was that corrupt president I mentioned. So when he fled to Russia, it was so unexpected. And this Russian occupation of Crimea and war in Donbass, eastern Ukraine, were so unexpected for me. But when I remember the history of the Holodomor, I understand that Ukrainians should have foreseen this. What is happening in Donbass and Crimea is not the end of Russian encroachment towards Ukraine, because nowadays the Russian president denies the fact that the Holodomor is a genocide. Actually, he denies the existence of the Ukrainian nation as such. We all understand that the Holodomor occurred because Soviet authorities were afraid to lose Ukraine. They did not want it to stop being part of the Soviet Union. The Russian president denies the of the Ukrainian modern state. They're constantly trying to take away our history. Such attempts to take away our history are very dangerous because in this case, we have a situation where one is put on another identity. And as a result, one identity assimilates on the other one. We have to stand our ground. We do not have the right to forget about Holodomor because it will take us to another genocide. It was really stunning for me to read this interview that was now almost six years ago um, and some of the themes that I'm gonna talk about now. Um, so I wanted to talk about this transformation of what it meant to be Ukrainian. 
And that happened for different types of people who are Ukrainian citizens today. And so there were Ukrainians of Ukrainian ethnic heritage. And I'll just let you read this while I talk, but this story is basically talking about this man telling me that he was a typical Soviet person. He grew up in a you know very kind of hardcore communist family. He, can, he considered himself Russian. And finally, at the age of 14, his parents spring on him the dark family secret um, that he was actually Ukrainian. Um, and he was so shocked that he walked 10 kilometers at a minimum, just like couldn't believe that he was Ukrainian. Um, and so he talks about his transformation to understanding himself to be Ukrainian lasted from the age of 14 until 30 years old. This is what I was talking about before this idea of controlling Ukrainian identity, erasing it in different ways. Um, and so this transformation for many people of, of ethnic heri Ukrainian heritage, this idea that actually it wasn't something to be ashamed about, um, but that was something that, that people in Ukraine had to go through of that heritage. Um, I want to mention too, you can see a lot in the kind of uh, statues that we make in our society is this statue in downtown Kiev tells a story. Um, so you have the, the brothers, it was um, called the People's Friendship Arch and during the Soviet time. And um, this picture is from August, 2015. And so you can, it's the big, strong, bare chested brother built to represent Russia and the kind of scrawny Ukrainian next to him. And over time, people were not satisfied with that narrative um, of constantly being sort of put down and told in different ways. And so you can see by 2015, right after the Revolution of Dignity, they've already painted on it, Slava Ukraini, the um, sort of like Viva la France of, of Ukraine. Um, and I also wanted to point out that in 2018, these activists put um, a piece of tape that symbolized the arch being cracked. But what some people don't know is that they timed that to Holodomor Remembrance Day. And so the Holodomor was actually there. I sometimes call it a externally opaque narrative where perhaps international observers weren't picking up on it, but people were using that story to communicate things. And a kind of update to the story is that the, in April of 2022, something about doing massive war crimes against your neighbor as the Russian state really made people just not want to have the statue at all. And so this arch has now transformed the name into the Arch of the Freedom of the Ukrainian people. And you can see that it was removed just after the escalation began. But I also wanted to talk about my interviewing with other Ukrainians, um, Ukrainians who did not have Ukrainian ethnic heritage. And um, there's really, um, you know, this transformation that's happening as, as many Ukrainians have felt an existential threat. Um, so you have on starting, let's see, let's, I'll just start at the top left. You have a statue that was created um, honoring Ukraine's Roma population. This was included in a popular song last year where they were celebrating their Roma community um, who stole a Russian tank. I remember people saying, nowhere else in Europe do you have such cool Roma community as in Ukraine. And so it was something about being Ukraine was bigger than, than traditionally um, conceived ideas. And you see this going back much farther. So, um, you know, you have the first, the mural is of one of the first people to be killed during Yura Maidan, and he actually has Armenian heritage. Um, the, the man showing the tattoo, he is an ethnic Russian Ukrainian who was very proud to be Ukrainian. He said Ukrainian in his mind, even though his family heritage is Russian, and he's showing off a tattoo he has where he's um, tattooing traditional Ukrainian heritage symbols onto his arm, representing for him um, the sense of, of being free, which is just contrasted to, to being Russian for him. You also have the person credited with starting the, the revolution of dignity. He's um, a, a, he's a Afghan Ukrainian. Um, he now works for the Ukrainian government. Going down, you have um, Ukraine's first gold medalist, who's now a member of parliament. One of his parents is from Rwanda, one is from Ukraine. Um, that breaks my heart now with the amount of suffering that's captured in his heritage. And then you, you have also, again, capturing the heritage of suffering in people's background. You have a picture of me 
and um, my research assistant, Oksana, were meeting with um, a man who does a lot of the textbooks for Ukrainian education. He works for a Jewish foundation in Ukraine and would talk to me about his family being impacted by both the Holocaust and Holodomor to talk about the unhealthiness of putting these histories in any kind of competition together, but recognizing that many people had, had suffered from both if you were a Jewish person um, and talk, having these hard conversations over the last 10 years about historical healing. And I think some of those conversations created the groundwork for the tweet that I have on the bottom left, where you have um, a person of, of Jewish heritage, but mixed other heritage, um, also wearing what he calls his Jewish Ivanka. Uh, it's a traditional play on the Ukrainian Vishivanka name, which captures that um, traditional style of embroidery that's almost a thousand years old. And he's posing with Ukraine's Minister of Defense. Um, now, if you speak Ukrainian and you know his last name, you can hear it right away. Ukraine's current Minister of Defense, his last name is Rezhnikov. And um, you can hear a couple things in his last name. So first of all, Rezhnik is, it was a kosher butcher. That's the Ukrainian word for being a kosher butcher. So you can hear his Jewish heritage in his name. And you can also hear the kind of Russian power and colonialism in his last name, because Rezhnik, the Ukrainian word, was transformed into Rezhnikov, the Russian ending of his name. So whenever you hear his name in the news, you might think about some of these um, identity issues going on. And I also, I don't think I have time, but I want to mention too that when I was in Ukraine, the country experienced martial law for the first time in its history. There was a big incident with, with um, ships bearing the Russian flag, ramming Ukrainian ships. And I want to just point out that this all happened during the 85th anniversary commemoration weekend in Ukraine. So the Holodomor is kind of always there telling us these things. Um, and I'll, I'll skip ahead, but there's this video from 2018. You can look it up, I can send you. But this idea that commemorating the, Holo the, um, the Holodomor and, and capturing this protection of, of Ukraine's community now being expanded to include a lot of people um, when needed to be protected. And so, um, you know, this is one of Ukraine's current Nobel Peace Prize winner, Alexander Matvichuk, who I have interviewed for my work for many years. And she said, you know, there, this was a this hundred day anniversary of the escalation, which was supposed to be Russia's three day military special operation going on. It's in nine years of war and going on for four centuries. So again, this theme of history that I talked about. Um, now, I want to just point out that I wrote this article actually as a graduate student in February 2018. And I said, the Holodomor in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, which was actually a little bit provocative at the time, I had to push for it because Russia was still denying its official presence. But I said, the Holodomor in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, history repeating, um, I was really concerned with what I was hearing. And, you know, I was just a graduate student. So how did I pick up on it? And let's say Putin did it. Um, so how did they miss this? How did Russian armed forces miss this? And what is the role of Russian people and participants in violence? Um, there was this idea that Ukrainian nationalism or sense of, of pride in your heritage and your community was artificial. There was prejudice, there was cultural chauvinism. We can see that in the statue picture I showed you. There was this belief in Russian superiority. Um, and there was this continuing effect of Russian and Soviet colonialism in Ukraine. I want to skip ahead to this because it's really, I think, important that we talk about some of the, the ways that the state of Russia also handles Nazi heritage, since they are um, really vehemently, explicitly, and regularly calling Ukraine a Nazi state. I think something that is very troubling um, and important for us to understand with a lot of the ways that the Russian state commemorates the Holocaust is that the story of Jewish victims so more than 6 million European Jews who were brutally murdered is often missing from the story of, of World War II in Russia. So when you go in a World War II monument, it's usually the story that is being told to you is very little mention of Jewish victims and lots of mention of how um, Soviet Union, which AKA and their telling was Russia, um, saved the world, essentially, was on the right side, which is a little bit questionable given the late 30s history, but that's the story being told. So it's, you know, I think I always say one of the hardest parts of my job as a genocide scholar is people ask me, you know, what are the perpetrators thinking? And sometimes it's so horrific. Like, I, I hate that question because it's, you know, you have to go deep into what they're thinking, but, but this is what I think is happening. You know, the, the view of being a Nazi is not the way I think of a Nazi. I think of people who slaughtered innocent Jews 
Moscow and other minorities, the way I think they speak of a Nazi is to be an anti-Russian. Um, and you see that in some of the explicit media sources that come out of here. I use this one, denazification. Uh oh, Diane. I see that. I think uh, we just leave it as it is, and she'll do the same. Call back again. Okay, let me. I think the screen share made a difference. Stop sharing, yeah. Too bad. Okay. Let's see yeah. she... Christina, are you there? There. Hi, and I'm back. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So, did you did you hear what I was saying? About what? <laughs> <laughs> what is the last thing you heard? You, you were talking about. Um, yeah, that was the slide. The slide. Okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can get it going again. Did you did you hear me talk through the slide? Should I start from the beginning? Oh, you were talking about Jewish Holocaust representation. Right. Okay. So I'll start there. So, you know, one of the, the things that, that you notice if you look at the way that Russian, the Russian Federation state narrative on World War II, if you go to museums that are created by the state, not by grassroots efforts, but by the state, you'll notice a very conspicuous lack of, of honoring the more than 6 million European Jews who were killed. Um, the story in those museums, the story in the state Russian museums is essentially the Soviet Union, Russia, uh, saved the world by fighting the Nazis. And that's very different than how I think about the Holocaust, how I think about World War II, where the first thing that comes to mind for me is, is the targeting of, of Jewish people, as well as other minorities, but Jewish people, that's what I think about. But when you think about it with how the Russian state uses this word Nazi, you begin to hear, you, you have to look at it through their lens as anti-Russia. So when you look at the state media and you look at some of their genocidal rhetoric against Ukraine's national community today, which includes many Jewish people, Jewish president, Jewish defense minister, you set out the word Nazi for the way that we look at it and what is the more historically correct way. Um, you you set out the word Nazi for anti-Russia. So denazification will inevitably include de-Ukrainization. Being Ukraine is an anti-Russia. Uh, Ukrainian desires for independence availed the country's true Nazism. That's hard to understand if you look at it how we do, but you hear that now if you, if you think about the way that they grapple with that history or perhaps fail to grapple with that history. Um, and then you look at Ukraine, Ukrainism is an artificial anti-Russian construct. And so that's really how state is using the word Nazi. Not hearing, when I hear the word Nazi, I think about the, the brutal murder of, of more than 6 million Jewish people and, and others, um, but I hear that. But for them, when they say Nazi, think anti-Russia, to be against the Russian regime currently led by Vladimir Putin. And that's very important. Uh, it's lost in translation, I think, without understanding the kind of failure to include the story of Jewish victims in the way the Russian state tells the story today. Um, and so, so what's going on with Russian atrocities in Ukraine? It's just been brutal. It's very hard to characterize these things in words alone, but I'll do my best. So there's this dehumanizing genocidal language. There are whole databases that collect that now. There's a high level of torture, a high level of violence. There's the bombing of civilian infrastructure to a level that it's been called a crime against humanity. Um, also the explicit targeting of cultural heritage features. There's also hunger and grain ex, um, expropriations. What was kind of very shocking for me in Southern Ukraine this past summer was edicts that I've seen in Soviet archives that were used during the Soviet Union to requisition grain were just recycled. They were the same, the same language with a different national logo on it, not the Soviet Union, but now the Russian Federation. There's also the targeting of, of language and history. The sign for Mariupol is really telling because um, you can see what, what the Russian bombardment did to the city. 
people were really um, in, in terrible, terrible need. Um, and the Russian administrators prioritized repainting the city sign and changing the Ukrainian Cyrillic, which has that letter I, um, to the Russian Cyrillic form of it, when instead, if their narrative was really people, it's confusing why they would do that. There are also deportations. Um, people like me are working a lot with this issue of trafficked children. Um, that is, it's very hard to know how many. It's believed a minimum of 19,000 Ukrainian children have been taken into Russia. Russia held a press conference last week where they said that they've taken 720,000. That would be three quarters of a million children. So it's very hard to know if they're picking those numbers to try and scare people or if that's grounded in reality. Um, but also this erasure and cultural and language of Ukraine. So, you know, this is a database, I don't have time to do it, but it's really been quite, quite horrific um, in indicating this kind of genocidal logic that I write about in my larger work. Um, and I wanna bring that up because it's really important to understand what's going on. It's important for us to know how to advocate, how to engage this issue. What I see happening in Ukraine is the targeting of the Ukrainian national group. Because I showed you this picture, this transformation of what it meant to be Ukrainian, um, which includes people, Jewish Ukrainians, Afghan Ukrainians, Armenian Ukrainians, Roma Ukrainians, all of these people are suffering together. It's a targeting of, of people who view themselves as belonging to the Ukrainian national group. Um, and that's very important. I wish I had more time. I'm not sure I do or that I have the technology, but I'd be really glad to share this five minute video around um, it. it I think we have time for that, Christina, do we have time? if you're not worried about, yeah. Oh, I would love to show this. Okay, so this is a really important testimonial. As it says on the screen, this is an 87-year-old Ukrainian woman who is a Ukrainian Holocaust survivor. So I do have it queued up. I would love to show this video. Um, let us cross our fingers for all good technological okay. luck. Um, give me just a moment. There we go. Okay, can you hear the sound? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Now we don't. Yeah, Christina, there's no video. We can hear the sound, but the video isn't moving. Oh, technology is not working for us. I apologize. Should I try one more time? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, now it's blank. Oh, that's so Sorry. disappointing. Um, so what I can do is I can circulate this to you, Diane, and for anyone who attends, right. um, and I can pop it in the chat. I'll just take a quick, um, I'll take a quick screenshot of the chat. And can you can you hear me now? Yes. Screen. Okay. So I'll put this in the chat, and I'd really um, encourage you. You know, I always say that this is a hard and painful work, but when I watch stories like Elvira, I'm so. I'm so sorry for her suffering. I'm so inspired by the life she built through suffering um, that I really want to share it with you. And I will put it in the chat. I'll summarize it for you. So Elvira Bortz is a victim of the Holocaust. She's Ukrainian. She suffered from it. And a couple of the things that she shares are the fact that she was never able to have children with her husband because of some of the um, experiments and hardship that were done to her. She um, you know, survived the Soviet Union, which was very challenging for people in many ways. And um, she lived in Mariupol in Ukraine. And she became, I can tell from watching her, just kind of a powerhouse. She, as an architect, designed Mariupol as a city. And so not only was it devastating and painful for her to have to flee her home, but when we look at Mariupol as a city, it was actually designed by this woman whose story I'm going to put in the chat. Um, and so she's talking about, you know, these areas of suffering, these layers of suffering, um, and she begins to talk about how what she experienced in Mariupol was, was she calls it worse for her than what happened under the, the Nazi um, siege of the same area. And so it is very, very hard to hear these words. I'll also mention, just adding a layer of pain to it, the journalist who, the Ukrainian journalist, created this video for Voice of America. She lived in my old neighborhood in Kiev and she was killed. This was the last story that she produced because a Russian missile hit her apartment and killed her in her kitchen. Um, and so just a sort of compounding um, trauma that what's going on both in Elvira's story with the historical things that she experienced with the fact that she was able to rebuild her life 
build a city like Mariupol and then it be destroyed again. Um, you know, when you need that sort of extra gas in the tank, I watch a video like this and I just keep working. Um, so I'll put that in the chat right when I wrap up my talk and I, I hope you'll take the time to watch it. She's really a, an incredible woman. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what targeting the Ukrainian national group means because it includes Jewish Ukrainians like Elvira. Um, so, you know, what I have seen going on in Ukraine and, and Ukrainian national sentiment and being part of the Ukrainian national community, even if you're not of an ethnic Ukrainian background and heritage, um, there was this kind of irreversible transformation of what it meant to be Ukrainian. A lot of people had suffered together first in the revolution of dignity at the hands of their own government, and then really suffered when, you know, days later, Putin began the war by seizing Crimea. So over time, there was this melding of things that we might think about traditional Ukrainian heritage features, like I mentioned, Vishivanka is the traditional embroidered clothes, um, and uh, it was transformed into what they call the Jewish Ivanka with the Star of David sewn in there to sort of combine your identity as a Ukrainian person and a Jewish person. Um, and so it was this melding of traditional Ukrainian heritage features, what it means to speak Ukrainian in certain environments, um, you know, it really is impacted by the war. I think that a lot of the issues um, began not just last year, but much earlier um, and in 2014. And these symbols and these national stories became kind of fused for a lot of Ukrainians' minds with values of freedom, self-organization, it's kind of growing pluralism, kind of finally working through some of the very hard conversations that people had to have about their families' intertwined histories in Ukraine and multiculturalism. Um, I can tell you that I, as an anthropologist, did a lot of surveying over nine years in 32 different locations. And I would ask Ukrainians of all types of backgrounds what the most important value for their nation was for them. And I didn't list any that wasn't like a multiple choice. I would just see what they said. 97% across all locations said freedom was the most important value for them. And so for me, I see, you know, Ukrainians kind of working through the past with this kind of freedom. And that freedom was involved with a little bit more of just pluralism, which sort of means letting people be. Um, and I think actually Vladimir Putin and, and his regime since 2014 driving a lot of those changes because of their explicit targeting of Ukraine for you know nine years now. So these values became increasingly at odds with an increasingly autocratic Russia. Um, so, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Russia as well, and we used to say every summer it would feel like, you know, every year we would mark like a little bit less free than last year, a little bit more restrictions. And so it was maybe what you can think of as a frog in this boiling water that happens slowly. Um, and it's it's very sad to see. It's very upsetting to see to see that happen in real time. But as you can imagine, if, if the way the Russian government uses Nazi is anti-Russia, now they're defining what Russia is, right? And they're an autocratic, kleptocratic regime under Putin. So this neighbor next door that is trying to make reforms where it's people are talking about freedom, that's very dangerous for a regime like Putin's. Uh, because if Ukrainians could do it, then maybe the Russian people would want that too. And I think that that's what's going on here. So it's more than denying Ukraine its sovereignty. It's more than saying we want to be political custodians of your future, which is still wrong. But it's more than just saying like, no, we're going to control your votes. It's actually attempting to destroy Ukraine's national identity, which is really important for us, I think, for the genocide community, for the Holocaust community, because so many of of um, you know, the Ukrainian national community or even people of Jewish heritage. Um, and so it's unwillingness on the part of the Kremlin to co coexist, indicating this real brittle insecurity. So um, I'm very bullish on Ukraine's odds in this war. I think that this has been an incredibly painful year. We don't wanna underscore the suffering at all. Um, but I think that this is driving even deeper national unity in ways that are really unexpected. Um, so I'll mention as I sort of close up that there is this growing Ukrainian national confidence. And as I talk about the Holodomor, as I think about the Holodomor, I view this national confidence as something that I think Ukraine should have had for many years. You know, I lived there. I really enjoyed living there. I think they have a lot of great things about the society, but I would talk to people in my taxi rides and they would say, why are you living here in Ukraine? Like, 
you're American, you could be elsewhere. And, you know, so it was this idea that being Ukrainian was something to be quite proud of, was something that was slower to develop because of the Soviet repressions of that. Um, and now we see it kind of blossoming under this existential threat as people come together. And, um, you know, I see that, I hear that now everywhere. So this picture I have of, um, it's a, it's a <laughs> regional governor in the south of Ukraine. Again, that would have been that red, you know, Russian speaking, Russian oriented, culturally maybe map. Um, he's from that part of Ukraine. He's also representing what I'm talking to you about. Ukraine is, is diverse. His name is Vitaly Kim. He's of Korean heritage. Um, he's the governor down there. And so he well known for this Ukrainian expression, which translates to good evening, we are from Ukraine. And, you know, I think if you don't understand kind of what we might think of as the modern miracle of Ukrainian national confidence under threat, this expression as a wartime logo is a little bit odd. You know, you think of it's like, we're going to fight, we'll resist, and Ukraine has those too. But this expression, good evening, we are from Ukraine, is really resonating with people. And I, I hear that as linked to this national confidence and this national unity. And I hear that as, as kind of overcoming some of the past of Holodomor and also of, of the Holocaust and, and other types of Soviet repressions that I haven't talked about in this presentation. And so this also leads to a staunch resolve. This is the number one thing I hear from Ukrainians. If Russia stops fighting, there will be no war. People will go home. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no Ukraine. And, you know, it's, it's really, I think, important to understand that that was shaped during the Holodomor. I'm really sort of taking advantage of my time, but I might mention one other story that I didn't understand at the time that I do now. I remember watching a, a video that was made in Ukraine with my Ukrainian friend. We went to the theater and we saw this movie and it was about um, the Mongol empire sweeping into Ukrainian lands. It was a historic movie set, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And in the movie, um, I was very sad. I was really depressed by the end of this movie because you have your protagonist and his family slowly dies. His dad is killed, his mom is killed, his older brother is killed. All of the people around him and are slowly dying by this wave of, of invaders coming. But he survives and his village love interest, his childhood friend survives with him. And I walked out of that movie so sad. I was so sad. The whole guy's family and community had been killed. And I walked out of it with my Ukrainian friend who said, ah, like, that had a, you know, I feel encouraged by that ending. I got mad at him a little bit at the time. It was five years ago. And I said, how could you be so callous? Like so many people died. A real moment of cultural disconnect. And, you know, I really didn't understand, I think, until last year, kind of what's going on that made us react to that historical movie in a different way. So I'm American. I didn't experience my family being targeted historically in that way. Like some Americans, I'm not sure what my heritage is, but I just don't have those family stories. Um, I think if you're a family, though, perhaps um, families that might be on the call of Jewish heritage or Ukrainian heritage, there's this idea, at least there was in the background of, of my friend's mind, that his grandparents had been targeted in the Holodomor. And now today, unfortunately, you know, he himself is, is being targeted by another genocide. And so just the fact that some people survive to carry on your, your identity, your language, your national stories, your culture, you begin to look at it a different way that I, at the time, could just not understand. And so that's what I'm talking about, staunch Ukrainian resolve, really shaped in unconscious ways by, by understanding the violence that has been inflicted on your family. Um, and so I think that this is, too, a continued transformation into a political. And I hear this in the last poster down at the bottom that's showing a Ukrainian tractor pulling away a decrepit Russian tank. The expression there translates to everything will be Ukraine. And, you know, I hear that and I understand how that might not make sense um, if you don't understand the region or Ukraine. Um, but what I've come to understand is that for many people in this part of the world that has experienced much violence, that has experienced a lot of totalitarianism, a lot of control of political thought, that now, not always, but now being Ukrainian means something and it means freedom now. Uh, it means this kind of growing, like fledgling pluralism. And so, you know, when I hear my friends of many different heritage backgrounds, 
Ukraine and saying everything will be Ukraine. What I hear them saying is like, we will keep this kind of island that we have made for people to, to live out their differences together. Um, and so, you know, I think that that is really an undeniable strength in a society. Uh, as I said, I remain very, very bullish on their, their prevailing. So these are ways you can stay in touch with me. Um, I'd love to answer questions from the audience now or stay in touch in, in other ways. And I really appreciate you being with me tonight. Well, Christine, thank you very much. I'm sorry we had our audio difficulties, but they, we were easily glossed over. Uh, we're waiting for questions from the audience, and we invite them to submit them now. I'd like to ask you, you, you're speaking about the transformation of Ukraine into a political nation. Now, we know that they became independent in 91, but it was really during the Orange Revolution that that exploded. Would you agree? Yeah. And today, how diverse is their civil society? I mean, how much room was there for people across different political persuasions, but what's the role of women? The role of other ethnicities. You pointed out their uh, tribute to the Roma. That's quite extraordinary in Eastern Europe. What can yeah. you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. This is something that I'm watching closely. So maybe I'll start with women. Um, you know, Ukraine is a country that has had traditionally patriarchal societies that, um, that I do not enjoy that much. But I will say that there were always people that were pushing back on it for my behalf. Um, and that's really how I look at it. You know, I, I wouldn't want to, I think that, you know, I'm an American and I try to be a little bit humble about also some of the problems that we have in our society as well. Um, but when I look at Ukraine, I look at a, a growth trajectory. Um, one of the things that's really transformed the role of women is the, this war that Russia has waged, but is now unlocking, I think, things that will lead to greater Ukrainian potential, like a fuller um, role for women. So I think the last stats I looked at were 70,000 Ukrainian women are in the armed forces, which is higher, percentage higher than most NATO countries. I looked at the percentage of, of countries of women in NATO countries, and Ukraine is a bit higher now. Um, and as we saw in our American history after World War II, that that leads to profound social changes. I also saw that happening too. You asked about other people of different backgrounds. Um, so I think the thing there to always look at is um, percentage of society and then percentage of people representing those groups who not only play a role in society, but feel they are effective. Um, and so there, I think it was again, a growth trajectory. You know, as you mentioned, the Roma community, um, the song was really a, a soul song written in honor of, of Ukraine's Roma community is, is really something for Eastern Europe. Um, and when I would ask, so I attended, I attended church religious services while I lived in Ukraine, and there's one kind of English speaking church that we would have a Russian translation because of people from other Russian speaking countries. And so we had about people from 25 different countries, every continent um, who attended that church. And that gave me kind of a prime opportunity every Sunday to ask, for example, people that I would know from Nigeria, like, hey, how is it for you to live? immigrant in the society? Um, do you think children are accepted as part of society? And they said, sure, like people just ask if our kids could learn Ukrainian. Um, that's like the, the main ask um, from that they expressed to me. And there were there are problems, there are racist people, there are sexist people. Um, but but when I would talk with people about that, they said, you know, like we're finding people are, are more open to talking about differences. And they said that that also this seems to be like the message that I kept getting was that this is related to the fact that, um, first of all, the Orange Revolution starting this kind of idea that, that being a democratic state um, was the direction Ukraine wanted to go and lean into. Then it was pushed along by the Revolution of Dignity, where so many um, people of Jewish background in Ukraine, of, of other backgrounds, were playing prominent roles and being seen as real Ukrainian patriots, um, you know, patriots meaning like good civic servants. Um, and, um, and then I think, you know, I had a person who um, told me one time back in 2016, he said, you know, he said, as a person who considers himself, myself a Ukrainian patriot, I probably better put up a statute of Vladimir Putin, because he said, if, if Ukraine hadn't been treated with this type of extreme threat by their neighbor, that maybe this process of coming together as a society may have had to happen over maybe generations. But this role of living next to a nuclear state 
um, that's bearing down on you, that has a history of, of this genocidal violence, really force people to come together and to try to find this national identity that might connect them across these heritage differences. Um, so, you know, I think like every society, this is a messy process. It's a jagged process. It involves a lot of hard conversations. It also involves a lot of debate. One thing that I really enjoy is debates in Ukraine's Jewish community. So there's lots of debates around there. But one thing that I think when I listen to those debates um, is the fact that there are debates. Um, for example, I might mention that President Zelensky and his Prime Minister Groisman, their overlap, uh, Prime Minister Groisman represented the previous administration that he had just defeated, but in the sort of peculiarities of the Ukrainian political system, they were together for some months. And they were quite, they were big rivals actually. Um, and so when I look at that ability to be people who represent a traditionally harmed group in Ukraine, and to look at the fact that they're actually able to be political rivals that go after each other on political differences, for me, that's indicating a deeper level of like, hey, we might not be under existential threat, we're able to actually be rivals. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm really eager to be back in Ukraine. I'm really eager to be capturing data on these processes that are unfolded, but that's what my research has been, has been indicating for some years now. Have you seen in all your time in Ukraine much evidence of anti-Semitism? Yeah, this is something that was such an important question for me um, because so much of my background is tied in with making sure that I support. I actually sit on the board of a couple of foundations for this and I was always asking this question. What I was told is that some people still experience anti-Semitism. Um, I was told that they felt they had people they could go to both in their community um, to talk about it. They weren't always sure they had, you know, sort of friends and allies in the Russian state. But what I will say um, is that many Ukrainian people do not feel that way either. So police reform is Thing that has been a big priority of Ukraine um, and that has been really uneven. And so the questions that I would ask, I'm, I'm such a scholar, aren't I? I'm raising more questions than answers. Like that's the worst reputation we have. <laughs> um, but um, the questions that I would ask are, did they feel they had less access to the state than other people? Um, and that I'm not sure they did. I think that actually it was a, it was a wider circle of people feeling very disenfranchised. I'll mention that I had um, a friend who's Ukrainian, her colleague who is of ethnic Ukrainian heritage was murdered during Euromaidan. The person who's believed to do it had a suspended sentence. So he never, there was never really any justice for a murder um, in that case. And that was kind of a pattern that I saw. So there were still these issues, of people not always sure where they could go to in the state. Um, I'm hearing like when I'm talking to people now, the big theme that has been shocking many people in Ukraine is really beginning last year when everyone truly has to pull together with the state, the military, civil society. The two big changes that I am hearing are, um, this is the first time in my life I have not viewed the state as my enemy, like my own government as my enemy. Actually, my government is on my side. And this is, you know, kind of blowing people's minds. This is a real transformation that's unfolding. Um, the other thing that I'm hearing from people is this idea of civil society um, is really expanding. So civil society was often, you know, people who are intentionally working for nonprofits or activists or things like that. I talked to, I heard from a journalist friend who was interviewing a construction worker and recently liberated on. And she said, like, what are we fighting for? She asked this construction worker, and he said, we're fighting for a freedom of speech, and we're fighting for freedom of this. And she said, actually, for her as a Ukrainian, hearing the articulation from people who are in fields like construction or industry, not associated always with being like a professional nonprofit, um, is really for her, she thinks, expanding in many people's ideas, who belongs to Society and who should say and who can now say there's really high expectations going forward to shape the society they live in. Wonderful. Very quickly, uh, Christine in our audience asks, can you comment on Ukraine's bid for NATO as it relates to what you've discussed today about denial of the Holodomor and Putin? 
Sure, that's such a good question. You know, it's really changed over my time in Ukraine. When I first started working in Ukraine, it was a minority opinion um, that, that there was this, this sort of threat from Russia, but I think it wasn't internalized by everyone um, for a long time. And, you know, now there are record numbers of, of Ukrainians wanting to join NATO. It's in the, I think it's 93% is the last poll I read, but it's very, very high. Um, it's jumped by about 70 points over my time in Ukraine. Um, and I think that that's connected to something that, you know, I was looking at some other polling of colleagues who are doing a lot of um, polling across Ukraine of just sort of, I hate to use this terminology, ordinary people, so not professional activists in any way, just like normal citizens, and asking them what they want from Russia after this. And they are finding that people want safety and they want justice much higher than actually even economic reparations. So economic reparations are sometimes folded into people's idea of justice, but they ask these questions in such a way as of, do you want a tribunal for Russian perpetrators or do you want the Russian state to pay you money? They're scoring in a majority opinion that they would rather have a court justice. And I bring that up because I think that, that Ukraine belongs in NATO. I think that that's good for European security architecture. I think that that's the only way forward. I think that that's good for NATO. It's good for Ukraine. But I also think that it's really important for people's idea of justice, because when people have a desire for justice that is grounded in the fact and the reality of what's for them, when that is not dealt with, um, through being in NATO or through these court systems, that that can turn into desires for revenge. And so I think that Ukraine being in, in NATO is, is good for Ukrainian society in many ways um, to channel that into justice and security and ways that you can move forward instead of feeling like you are again abandoned, again unsafe, and then all of those fester things, you know, of a lack of justice might turn into revenge. Christina, thank you so much. We have so much more more that we'd like to ask you, but we've run out of time, uh, so you'll just have to come back. <laughs> Thank you so much for having